Discussions on the KJV can turn heated, and the subject of its reliability is one of the most unclear subjects across internet searches. When I point out the facts during online discussions, I have been ejected from Facebook groups, called a heretic, and sometimes thanked for being able to make things more clear. That's what I want to do today. I want to make things more clear. And I ask you, please, uh, watch to the end of the presentation because uh, I'm sure to say something that may offend or disturb uh, someone about what you believe, but uh, God is a God of truth, and I just want to share the simple facts about this. So please, no matter what your conviction, please listen to the end of this presentation. I want to start off by letting you know that I use the King James Version as my English translation. I trust it. I trust that it accurately uh, translates the uh, Hebrew and Greek uh, that was preserved to every generation down to me today. I want to be as straightforward as I can be as we begin to discuss the question before us today. Which KJV do you trust? The KJV 1611 or the KJV 1769? To begin to understand this, you need to understand that the Bible wasn't originally written in English at all. As a matter of fact, the Old Testament was originally written mainly in Hebrew and the New Testament mainly in Greek. Now from those original language texts, the uh, KJV 1611 would be born. It would have four updates until 1769, and that is probably the KJV that you consider to be the KJV today, is the 1769 edition. Sadly, though, I have found that if you preach or teach from the King James Version today, you will be considered, at best, a ignorant hillbilly, or at worst, a heretic, leading a cult in the King James onlyism. These fake news ideals about these ideas come from two different sources. One is the KJV haters, and one is the KJV reinterpreters. Some people have a real hate for the King James Version. Uh, for example, they will tell you that it is based on corrupt manuscripts and that it is impossible for a human being at this point in time to read um, all of this nonsense. Uh, if someone were to, was to have said uh, just 20 years ago that uh, the KJV was based on corrupt sources and if you taught from it you were a heretic, you would have been laughed away. But that times have changed, it seems. Now these haters imagine those who use the KJV as cultists because of the KJV reinterpreters. You see, the KJV reinterpreters, they take uh, their stance on the King James Version and they reinterpret history. They make up facts as they go. Uh, they basically lie about all of this or they're horribly mistaken about what all has occurred up till now. And this has caused the haters to think that anybody that holds the King James Version must be that ignorant hillbilly or that heretic. Usually the haters will eventually ask the uh, KJV reinterpreters this question, the question that I have before me today. Which KJV do you trust, the KJV 1611 or the KJV 1769? The KJV haters who ask this question uh, want to imply that there have been these significant changes between the updates from 1611 to 1769, which is probably what you have in your hands today if you're reading the King James Version. Now let's be clear straight from the get-go. The changes in the modern Bibles that the KJV hater is, is supporting has actually cut the equivalent of First and Second Peter from the traditional text of the New Testament. This is clear from both sides of the debate. Daniel Wallace, a well-known professor of New Testament studies and not a proponent of KJV usage, has stated there are approximately 5,000 changes between the Textus Receptus, the Greek text used by the KJV translators, and the modern critical text used as the base for modern translations. Also, Dr. David Sorensen, author of Touch Not the Unclean Thing and a supporter of the KJV, confirms this truth as well when he states that the modern Bible deletes 19 verses, 45 verses have large chunks deleted, and 2,800 Greek words are deleted. That's the equivalent of 1st and 2nd Peter. The changes I will discuss today are nowhere near that type of change, but we cannot deny that there is change that occurs here. Sadly, though, when the KJV reinterpreter hears this, he uh, begins to make up all new inspiration for the Bible, how all of this occurred, changes history, changes the very facts in our hands today to answer this question. There are two types 
of KJV reinterpreters. First, the KJV re-inspired in English only. This view basically says that the English KJV is the only real Bible left in the world, that the scriptures in the original languages were lost or corrupted, and that God then re-inspired the KJV in 1611, restoring the perfect scriptures back to mankind. This literally means that God didn't preserve his word to every generation throughout time. Or the KJV preserved in English only. This view states that the KJV wasn't re-inspired, but has carried on inspiration into English, if that makes sense. So now the original Greek and Hebrew words that were being translated into English don't matter because those words have been translated into English. And it is sinful to even consider the original languages for any authority, even though that is what it was originally written in. The problem with this comes with passages such as John 21, 15 through 17, where Jesus is, is speaking, and the KJV translates this out as the English word love. Well, uh, if you understand the Greek there, you understand he's going back and forth from the word agape, which is a, a self-sacrificing type of love, to the word phileo, which is a friendly, brotherly love. And so there is a difference being made there that you don't see in the English because English doesn't have such a fluctuation about uh, love and how we would state love, but Greek does. Therefore, you would lose something. You would lose part of what's being preserved to every generation if you didn't reference the original language. These folks' argument would allow that part not to be passed down to every generation. So you see why it would be a threat to these KJV reinterpreters to say that there was any change from the KJV 1611 to the KJV 1769. To them, the English is the preserved word of God and not the uh, corrupted text that they state uh, are still fluctuating around. It's funny, in both of these interpretations, the KJV hater and the KJV reinterpreter, they both claim that the original languages are corrupted. But who really cares what the KJV hater or the KJV reinterpreter says? What does the Bible say? The Bible says that holy men of God wrote the inerrant scriptures in their language. 2 Timothy 3, 16a, all scriptures given by inspiration of God. 2 Peter 1, 20-21, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, the Bible states that God would preserve his word down to every generation. This is very clear that it will be preserved. As you see these verses pass by, you see, Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Uh, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. His truth endureth to all generations. Every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. The word of our God shall stand forever. My word shall not pass away, Jesus said. Peter said, The word of God which liveth and abideth forever, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And Jesus went so far as to say, Not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. The Bible even states in the beginning, the middle, and the end that there are severe judgments for anybody who would add to or take away from God's word. Deuteronomy 4.2 Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Proverbs 35-6 through 6, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. There hasn't always been an English language. Therefore, they weren't preserved in English to every generation. Those words that shouldn't be added to nor taken away are in the original language. Jesus himself said, not one jot or one tittle shall disappear from the law till all shall be fulfilled. A jot or a tittle is Hebrew punctuation. And Jesus also said, my word shall not pass away. Now, that was written down in Greek, not English. Now, that in no way discounts the fact that I can point to my Bible right here today and say, this is the word of God. And it is right here in my own language. The original documents would disappear 
uh, over a time, but faithful men would hand write these documents down into copies called manuscripts that would carry over the centuries and multiply. And, and we have more manuscripts of the Bible than any other ancient work. What I'm about to say next might surprise you or even disturb you, considering God's promise to preserve his word. Each Greek and Hebrew handwritten copy that is carried all over the earth, every one of them aren't exactly the same like would come from a copy machine. There might be a word that is slightly different or punctuation that isn't exactly the same. Slight differences uh, among these different manuscripts uh, because uh, there wasn't copy machines back then. It was left to humans to write these things down. And so there are slight differences that you see in all the handwritten manuscripts. Now men would eventually take uh, all these different manuscripts and compile them down into little editions that uh, a translator could use to uh, translate the Bible into different languages. Um, and they took the Hebrew Mesoretic text, that's all the different handwritten manuscripts they used and they compiled it into it. They took uh, all the different New Testament manuscripts that they had and they compiled them into this, which is called the Textus Receptus. Many don't realize today that the Western churches, where the churches in America derive from, weren't using the original Greek and Hebrew text for several hundred years until the 1500s when an event called the Reformation began. The Reformation was a movement back to the Bible as the authority in the Western churches rather than respecting the authority of the Pope. It was then that they went back to the original language that had never been lost to the East but set aside in the West and the English KJV was eventually born. Arthur Farstad, general editor for the NKJV, confirms this in his book, the, In the Great Tradition. Before the Reformation, the Western European churches had shown very little interest in the Greek Bible since Latin was Rome's liturgical language, and the Latin Vulgate was her authoritative Bible. Consequently, there were few Greek Bibles in the West before 1453, except for a few very old ones in the archives of some libraries. When the Dutch scholar Erasmus published the first Greek New Testament in 1516, he had just a few late manuscripts with which to work. Later editions of the Greek Testament were also based on similar manuscripts. So apart from minor variations, all the early printed editions are essentially the same. The Greek New Testaments used by the King James translators other than Erasmus texts include Complusion Polygot, printed in 1514, Stephanus' text, and Beza's text. The edition of Beza, particularly that of 1598, and the last two editions of Stephen's were the chief sources used for the English authorized version of 1611. The name Textus Receptus eventually was also applied in a general way to all texts of the Byzantine Eastern Church type. The traditional Greek text has been called the Textus Receptus ever since that time. There really wasn't any argument over the Greek that the KJV had used up until about the 19th century. When some other manuscripts from different regions were found that hadn't been preserved to every generation. Arthur Farstad confirms this also in his book in the Great Tradition. Until the 19th century, the Greek texts used by Bible translators were fairly uniform, being based on ancient manuscripts that were in substantial agreement. As a result, there were few questions raised concerning the conformity of the then current Greek text to the original autographs written by the hands of the evangelists and apostles. But in the 19th century, many earlier manuscripts of the Greek New Testament were discovered that caused some Bible scholars to change their approach toward evaluating the Greek text. This caused the creation of the modern Greek critical text, and this is the one that cuts away the equivalent of 1st and 2nd Peter. This is what the NIV, the uh, ESV, the NLT, all these different translations look to, to uh, translate their Bibles from today, and why they don't have the equivalent of 1st and 2nd Peter that is referenced in the KJV, and also in the NKJV, which uses the Textus Receptus to translate from. Why is this important? Because the original language is what was inspired of God. Only the original language did God promise to be available to every generation. Which brings me to the great similarity I want to show you between the KJV 1611 and 1769 before we look at their differences. They both use the same original language text to translate. The KJV 1611 and 1769 use the same original base text uh, that was preserved to every generation coming directly from the area where the churches are started from in the East. Now some people argue the Texas Receptus isn't uh, the basis uh, for the KJV New Testament. 
But of the 7,957 verses that are in the KJV New Testament, 7,709 of them reference the Textus Receptus readings. So I think when I, I can safely say that the KJV references the uh, Textus Receptus and the Hebrew Masoretic Text. Now, what do those KJV updates consist of? See, this is the big question. Will these changes there be more shocking than the, than the slight changes we see in all the different manuscripts throughout history? Will it be more shocking than the slight differences that we see amongst different Textus Receptus editions? Well, let's take a look at the evidence and see. Our first difference is the exclusion of the Apocrypha. The 1611 edition, when it was first published, included the Apocrypha. Here is a, a, a separate book of the Apocrypha that I picked up several years ago. Now, the Apocrypha are a set of texts that were included in the Septuagint. Uh, that's the uh, Greek translation of the Old Testament uh, that was uh, available during Jesus' time. It was also part of the Latin Vulgate, which was uh, the translation that was uh, pretty form foremost in the West uh, for hundreds and hundreds of years since 400s. But it was never part of the Hebrew Bible. The KJV 1611 added it so that they would have a reference to history. This is, gives you a little bit of the history between the Old Testament and the New Testament, but it was never considered to be inspired scripture. The Catholic Church eventually would uh, claim it to be inspired scripture in 1516, several hundred years after the fact, uh, but we do not consider the Apocrypha to be scripture, but this is a change from the KJV 1611 to the KJV 1769. Second, italicized words or phrases. Now this will probably be difficult for our KJV reinterpreters friends. See, the King James translators were very honest men who feared God and they wanted everyone to know that they were translating and not taking the authority away from the original languages that were preserved to every generation in any way. Therefore, they would show a difference in the font of the English words to show when the English words weren't originally represented in the Hebrew and Greek. They used these italicized words to help the English reader understand the original language better, but didn't want to be guilty of adding to the word nor taking away from it. Therefore, they made a distinction between their words and the original language. The King James Version 1611 was originally printed in the type style known as black letter, which has the following appearance. Words of the translation which were supplied to make the sense clear, but which were not represented in the Greek text used by the translators, were often set in a small Roman type, as you see here. In the 1769 edition, the ordinary text was set in Roman type, with the supplied words in italics. This feature was not uh, employed very consistently, though, in the 1611 edition, and in many places the supplied words are not indicated as you would expect. This inconsistency was probably the fault of the printer's compositors uh, who very often modified the spelling of the words which they were going through printing. The editors of the 1769 Oxford edition, though, uh, undertook the responsibility to make sure everything was right. They regularized the use of italics by italicizing all the words of the translation which did not have a counterpart in the Stevens 1550 Textus Receptus. So modern versions of the King James Version have more italics than the 1611 would have done. As an example, in the book of Matthew, uh, the 1611 italicizes 69 times, while the 1769 edition in the Gospel of Matthew italicizes 384 times. Number three, modernized spelling, capitalization, and punctuation. First of all, spelling. Now, why would there be misspellings in the 1611 edition? Well, the early printers employed various spellings according to the requirement of space. They would lengthen or shorten words in order to present the text in justified columns. You'll notice sometimes like the word 14 will be spelled two different ways in 1611. That is why the 1769 takes care of these spelling errors. For example, right now you're seeing a list from the Gospel of Matthew showing the different types of spelling that changed from 1611 to 1769. Now, capitalization. See, capital letters uh, were kind of irregular in the 1611 version of the uh, KJV, but in 1769 they sought to make it more regularized. It must be noted also that the 1611 nor the 1769 ever capitalized a member of the Trinity either. 
as the NKJV does. You're now seeing a list of all the changes in capitalization from the first chapter of Matthew from 1611 to 1769. Now punctuation. The 1611 edition was more heavily punctuated uh, than our modern uh, editions. And that's true in general for older books. But it appears that sometimes the uh, punctuation was influenced by mere considerations of space, as you can see in these examples. The fourth change, original errors of the press corrected. Now, as I've already been speaking about, there were different errors in the press. I mean, they would change different things among editions to make things fit and things of that nature. But sometimes there was just like really big changes, like a, a word would be written twice or a, a question mark would look like a, a exclamation point, different things of that. In 1611 to 1769, they changed these little uh, press mistakes. Here are some changes from the Gospel of Matthew from 1611 to 1769. Number five, minor alterations of the text. Now here is the biggie, the one that might concern our KJV reinterpreters, but shouldn't concern us because we know that there have been slight differences all throughout God's preservation of his word down through the centuries, right up to the very manuscripts that have these slight differences in them. Since we have seen that in the original handwritten copies, it shouldn't upset us that there would be slight differences in the most accurate English translation ever either, right? The list I'm showing to you right now includes all the changes to the text of 1611 which do not involve the correction of obvious errors of the press or changes of spelling or capitalization or punctuation. Now those may seem like a lot of changes to you, but in actuality, are there any changes there at all? Well, let's take a closer look at a few of these. Revelation 13, 6 reads, them that dwelt instead of them that dwelt. Is that a significant change? Ephesians 6, 24 adds a word, amen, at the end of the verse. Is that a big change? Acts 24, 24 reads, Jewess instead of Jew. Now here we have a female name replacing a general name of Jew. But let's look at the verses. And after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jew or a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Is that a change that's significant? No. John 12, 22, it reads, Tell Jesus instead of told Jesus. Uh, maybe that's a problem for you, but that's not a problem for me, these little small changes that occurred. It's not a problem for me either, the small changes uh, that you see here in the Textus Receptus between the Stephanus and the Beza, the different supports you found. Things like thou shalt call instead of they shall call. Things like he sat instead of they set him. Things like taught by trial instead of tempted. Now these minor changes are the same type of changes we saw in the Greek handwritten copies that came throughout time. The same type of minor changes we see in editions of the Texas Receptus that have come throughout time. And now we see them as the same type of changes that have happened to the KJV throughout time. The point is that these aren't big changes. These changes that aren't that big of a deal. Now the manuscripts uh, before the 19th century didn't have that much of a significant change. Just little things like this, uh, little words here or there. As Arthur Farstad said, I've already quoted it once, he said, until the 19th century, the Greek texts used by Bible translators were fairly uniform, being based on ancient manuscripts that were in substantial agreement. There is a reason why they were in substantial agreement. I believe they were the preserved line that God wanted us to have, the, the group of readings that was preserved to every generation. So the belief system that leads to the KJV does not discount what the Bible says about the words being preserved to every generation or Jesus saying that his word shall not pass away. Now the belief system leading to most Bibles after the 19th century lead in a different direction. If you trust the few earlier manuscripts that were found that were not preserved, then you must believe God did not preserve his word to every generation, but it was lost until we rediscovered it today. You must believe a new manuscript could be discovered that will change the text sometime in the future, perhaps. Thus, you will always question whether you have the real text or not. And Christians of the past corrupted the Bible to correct mistakes. 
Here are a few examples. Shall we believe that Jesus forgiving the woman caught in adultery is a fake story that was inserted into the Bible because the earliest manuscripts do not include it? Shall we be comfortable throwing away a verse that verifies the doctrine of believers' baptism in Acts 8.37, even while there are ancient church fathers who actually use this verse? Should we believe that the Lord's Prayer was actually doctored to have a proper ending and Christians have been saying it wrong for centuries? Shall we believe that all anger is sin and those crafty ancient Christians fix Jesus' words to say without a cause to make Matthew 5.22 make better sense than just saying everyone who ever gets angry is in danger of judgment? Shall we believe that Christians fixed the text so Jesus didn't look like a liar in John 7, 8 through 10? Because when you take away just that one little word yet here, it uh, implies that Jesus lied to his brothers and then went on up to the feast in Jerusalem. One little word difference after the 19th century makes a bigger difference than the little words that we saw beforehand. Even during the time of Paul, it was written that there were people who were trying to corrupt the Word of God. They were peddling a false gospel. In 1 Corinthians 2.17, For we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. So if there was corruption going on, even back during the time of the original writings, could it be that the older manuscripts aren't the better manuscripts, as all the Bible teachers like to say? Could it be that those are the ones that were supernaturally left and rejected back in the desert? And these huge majority, and the majority does clarify uh, a lot of this, could it be that they are the ones that are true? It, it seems to me the one that has been preserved to every generation is the one that is not corrupt. I'm not trying to belittle uh, those who have a different opinion, uh, but I have to say there are lots of things to consider here, and um, we need to come at this more, I think, with a faith aspect. You see, when it comes down to all of this, either on the KJV hater, the, the KJV preserved in English, all these different guys, there's always going to be a little bit of faith that you're going to have to have. Now, when I have a Bible that it's, it speaks in the NIV, it speaks in the KJV and the ESV, it all says that the, the true line is preserved down to every generation. Well, then I'm looking for that one that's been preserved to every generation. And that is what I believe I have in what backs up the King James Version, which accurately translates those words for me. Now, that takes faith, doesn't it? I have that faith. I believe that God preserved these words down to me to every generation, even though I see all these little minute changes, it doesn't shake my faith whatsoever. You can't say that when you've cut the equivalent of 1st and 2nd Peter away from your Bible uh, 2,000 years later. That type of thinking never believed there was a text preserved to every generation. And also the type of thinking that thinks that God just finally got his word preserved here around 1611 also is wrong. I believe that here are the words that have been preserved to every generation as the Bible states. This is the love letter that God has preserved and presented to you across all these centuries. Study it. That's the whole point. We must study these things out to see if they be so, so we can be certain of them in our heart. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth.